trees. The trees. Oh, really? Oh, feeling pretty dusty. <laughs> <laughs> Time to get on the road, I think. I'm filming this. I'm filming this. Got some kebabs to tempt them out. Chris, what do you reckon? So we wake up that morning and there is six inches of snow all around us and it was really, really cold. We're driving for about half an hour and then we see there's some river crossings that we need to go through. We picked the wrong line and within seconds of entering the water, steam started coming out and the engine died. Fuck. So we all met up in London. We spent a few days there, maybe a week or so of hanging out and doing little bits and pieces to the car and spending most of the day down the garage, scratching rust off, trying to give it touch ups on the paint and any little thing that we thought needed to be done. First inspection, she's a bit of corrosion, but just surface mate, otherwise she's a beast. Safe as houses. <laughs> Chris was our friend that we met in Thailand and he was the one that originally conceived the idea of doing the Mongol rally. We had organised that he would indeed join us um, roughly halfway through. Nice. Oh, yeah. uh, well, it looks pretty good from over here. I don't know what I'm looking at, so yeah, tidy, very tidy, yeah. We had found this micro, it was almost immaculate, it felt like some little old lady had probably owned it since 1991. It was in really, really good condition. It had four doors, um, it was 998ccs, uh, it was tiny, it was bright red, it was going to be uncomfortable and a tight fit. And it was perfect. The, corroded, the, yeah. the idea behind the Dusty Kiwis was that we were going for the look of foot rock flats. Radio. So gumboots, stubbies, black singlets, bucket hats from time to time. It was just something that said, yeah, Kiwi through and through. So obviously in foot rock flats, he has dog. And that meant that our team needed some kind of dog. Well, what do you reckon, dog? Should I give it a go? <coughs> the dog that came with us was actually found in a skip bin. So we put two holes through the ears and we just cable tied it and then just pulled it tight against the grill. Despite being a one litre engine, she goes pretty hard. She's got some guts when she needs to. One of the funniest things has been, there's a corner just around here. I don't know why, maybe just the way the car's set up or the condition of the road, but every time we go around this one corner, um, the tires squeal. doesn't matter how slow we're going around it, and it's just um, the most ridiculous thing to um, 
be in this tiny little car and feel like you're just doing donuts um, when you're not, but it sounds like you are. So yeah, it's cool. We had till lunchtime to get our act together and then it was, right, we need to be getting on the road. So we're all sitting there in our gumboots and our bucket hats and our singlets and we're just cruising down the highway with the windows down and all feeling good and excited and not really knowing what's in store and playing some good music and yeah, so far so good. Good friends Dan and Julia, one of their friends from Stratford, <laughs> and they all went for a ride into the city, and then I met up with them at the park later on. Megan, do you want to tell us about him complaining? Oh, <laughs> or what you heard? In my earplugs, well and truly, in my ears. Oh, okay. to no idea. But sure enough, <laughs> his voice pierces through like them at five in the morning, yeah. screaming for Mad Dog's help, which apparently is me now. And I was like, oh, he's actually broke his arm. Like, something a bit more serious. Like, uh, get out there for him to tell me it's just a buzzy bee sting. I was like, what do you want me to do about it? This is hour in the morning, get your ass to be like. Okay, Ralph, what happened last night? We just come downstairs from where we're staying. And Dog has now become Og. <laughs> oh no, what happened? Someone has reversed dog? into Dog. He's <laughs> <laughs> got like a little stump. Try and follow him. Been hit hard. 
knew someone oh, plastic it. surgery. Poor girl. <laughs> Give us a smile, team. <laughs> I loved the city during the day. It had a really cool atmosphere and all the really old buildings and stuff. I didn't like the nightlife there. It's not... It doesn't sit well with my moral compass. <laughs> but, it, yeah, I don't know. It was, it was a cool city with a really cool vibe. It felt like a pretty big milestone once we made it to Prague after boosting across France and Germany and Belgium. We'd already met up with a couple of teams along the way. At about lunchtime, we moved out to where the secret location of the start of the rally was. All we had was GPS coordinates. The adventurers had found this junk town or something that they hold a music festival at every now and again. And it's like a scene from Mad Max with wrecked, bombed out cars everywhere up on top of big steel structures. And then just in and amongst it was just these lines and lines of colourful, ridiculous, crappy little cars that were supposed to be driving all the way to Mongolia. It was surprising to see the amount of teams that already had their toolboxes out lying underneath the car doing immediate repairs before the start day the following day. <laughs> Dylan came up to us sitting at a table getting the night underway and announced that he may or may not have accidentally entered our car into some kind of competition. Before we knew it, Ralph was driving the poor wee girl into the middle of the crowd of about a thousand people. The real test of these cars to see who was better was to see how many people could fit in and on both of these cars.
quality. Oh, feeling pretty dusty. <laughs> Time to get on the road, I think. <laughs> it's insane to me. Fuck that shit. It's not good. How are you going, Ralph? Um, mentally preparing for the day. I Physically think. not prepared. <laughs> Will I get there? I'm not sure. <laughs> Mad dog. What's going on? Watching everyone else be an absolute piece of shit while I clean up everything. <laughs> so we can actually start this race at a reasonable hour. Hey, 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 hey. Let's rewind to 24 hours ago when you weren't even capable of moving. <laughs> oh, that's a trooper. <laughs> how the tables have turned. How's the pack now going, Woody? Hey? How's the pack down going? The pack down? Yeah. We started, have we? <laughs> I'm still sleeping. <laughs> it's not good. So, waking up in this tent, very dehydrated, wondering what the hell happened and what the hell is going on outside, and just hearing groans from the other tents around me. It was um, a very slow pack up. With a bit of wind blowing through the hair to revive us, actually felt pretty good because that was a bit of a bit of adrenaline, well needed adrenaline to get us started. <laughs> oh no, good luck! <laughs> Everyone was on a level, like you know, you've got 300 cars all blasting their horn in a convoy, and you're seeing flags waving everywhere, and. <laughs> it was it was cool. It was very cool leaving. It was a very um, exciting way to set us off and planted some good seeds in our minds as to what the finish party could be like. Leon's a really cool place, really cool. We went into the center of town and it's all these little alleyways and courtyards that have little passageways underneath um, buildings that take you out to some other little alleyway and it's quite famous for it. It's specific to Leon, I think. Jeez. Oh, <laughs> Yummy. <laughs> <laughs> Very big pizzas with more cheese on them. How do you say the name of it, Megan? Uh, leave that to the professionals. <laughs> <laughs> Prosciutto. <laughs> we went up to the cathedral that's um, on a cliff that overlooks all of Lyon, and that is easily the most impressive building that I've ever seen. It's a few hundred years old, but. The mosaics inside of it are just out of this world. From Lyon, uh, that was the end of visiting people. So we drove east towards Switzerland. You could tell you were in a different country because we approached mountains. A lot of France was quite flat. Obviously not all of it is, but where we were driving through the middle it was lots of rolling hills and great big plain all right boys where are we and what has happened well we're in switzerland got back to our car dylan started driving <laughs> he's a rough bastard <laughs> now the exhaust is just now dragging across the ground <laughs> hmm. so a uh, quick fix by ralph with the cable the ties one. nice <laughs> and we'll be good as new fingers crossed first repair nice once we crossed the border into Switzerland, things really started getting a lot steeper, really impressive mountains, and we started seeing some awesome, awesome lakes. Switzerland was definitely a highlight country for me. I'm attracted to big landscapes and um, I guess natural beauty. 
there was just this like permeating feel of calm that kind of hit us as we were driving through. We are just in a fucking crazy place. Through the middle of it, you have these great big long lakes and they're this kind of aquamarine teal color that in the middle of summer just are irresistible to jump into despite the fact that when you get in you realize they're actually still you know glacial melt water and it's actually quite cold but it's absolutely beautiful side of these lakes you've got these cliffs that just rise into mountains that would be you know three or four kilometers high probably well they seem to be that high anyway still there was hardly anyone around you're driving through the countryside and you would just see you know a few chalets dotted through these perfectly green fields it was very very peaceful and relaxed country i liked it a lot and i'd love to go back for sure Hey everyone, here we are in beautiful Switzerland and the water is a beautiful temperature. You wanna go test it out? Might do, definitely. Right. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> the Stelvio Pass was huge, like height wise, but also just the amount of time that it took to cross it. Like you really are going over the Alps. It took us hours to get over and the beautiful thing about it was that you're coming up the side of a valley and then it's just this huge mountain on the other side. It's an incredible piece of road. It was definitely one of the most memorable parts. Generally speaking, there were really nice spots to Freedom Camp along the way, but it was hit and miss. Some nights where we camped, it was horrific, and nights that you just want to forget and you didn't get any sleep. But then some nights were just like picture perfect, and it was really beautiful, and it was what the whole trip was about, and it kind of reminded us why we did choose to do a lot of camping. Because it definitely made it feel like a lot more of an adventure. What do you got there, Megan? Tick repellent. <laughs> Tick repellent. <laughs> so we ring around the ankles and we're good to go. <laughs> we're still going to get the ticks though. Yeah. I doubt it. He's the tick whisperer. <laughs> the first part of Europe, there was a lot of distractions and um, we were out and about a lot more. So we were getting, I guess, a little bit of a break from each other and then we were meeting other friends and stuff like that. Was it dull? <laughs> so we weren't in a, each other's faces quite as much, but then I think once we kind of started getting into those more Southern European countries and it was long days in the car, just camping at night, um, it did start to get a little bit more testing. <laughs> How's the shower going, Woody? 
I think that might have been a point for me too where I started realising what I was in for. In some ways we were already so far through the trip, but we were not even that far through the trip. <laughs> you just kind of start to get a little bit sick of each other, I guess. You know, you just want a new face or... It, it got overwhelming because I've never been on a trip for that long or in such testing circumstances. It started to get a bit overwhelming. What's on the menu tonight, boys? Yeah, we have a big old can of ravioli. <laughs> Costs it about $7. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully it's worth it. So it had been, it'd been a long day driving. I think we were all just pretty knackered. We'd had a few pretty average night sleeps. And then we were down in a bit of a valley and um, trying to look for somewhere to camp for the night. And as we're driving up this hill, there's big black rainy clouds coming in down the valley. You put the inner of the tent up in the rain and then try to put your fly over the top. Well, your inner's already wet and you're just going to have a wet, soggy night's sleep. So in my head, I'm like, we need to get these tents up before the rain so that, you know, the inside of our tents don't get wet. It just felt like everyone was just wasting time and no one had any sense of urgency to get tents set up before it rains. It was just one of those times where it just felt like it wasn't being listened to, you know, like no matter how many times I just kind of mentioned that we need to keep looking down on the flat in the valley for somewhere to camp up. It was just as if I wasn't even there. Anyway, we got down to the bottom of this hill and again they pulled over and were mucking around deliberating on where to go and this cloud's just coming in and then these massive raindrops are starting to drop and it was just like, just so frustrating. Hello everyone. Um, tonight is our first proper night of freedom camping. So yeah, we were actually up on this hill, way up there looking for a field um, and we realised that you don't really get flat ground on a hill. However, we have managed to find another slope for the evening. Um, we were kind of rushing because uh, there was a bit of rain that came through just before, um, but it seems to have actually cleared off now. So hopefully our tents don't get saturated tonight, but um, we'll see what happens. Um, yeah, so hopefully tonight's sleep isn't too bad. Hopefully it doesn't blow or wash away down the hill. I don't think everyone's too impressed that we are here tonight, but here we are regardless. So we'll just make the most of it. Um, and hopefully have a dry night. We've got the tarp up, so if we need to cook up underneath that, then we can, but um, at the moment we are just in some lonely ski slope in the middle of summer um, with no one around really so it's actually kind of perfect um, despite the slope um, but yeah anyway that's it then when we did finally find this flat spot i rushed to set up like a tarpaulin more as like a group space because when you were like the car is so small there's no room to move it around within the car. You've got to pull everything out. I'm like wrestling with this tarpaulin and this rope to just try and set up a group space so that we could keep everything else dry while we set up the tents. This was just one example, but it would just been little situations like this building up for so long. And I was just feeling really homesick as anyone does when they're away traveling. And it was just this combination of just feeling so alone and just this really overwhelming feeling. So, um, this trip, for this trip we're, you know, trying to do a big push for mental health and although we're raising money for them as well, I think an important thing is raising awareness and part of raising awareness is, is having, a, having a good chat about it, you know getting things off your chest and hoping that someone will listen um, so this is gonna be my little rant <laughs> um, because I want to be able to look back on this trip and know that I made it through times like this not mm -hmm. just brushed all under the carpet so yep this will be my first time crying on camera which is just great <laughs> um, Being my first time properly traveling overseas um, and traveling with three boys, two of whom I didn't meet until I got here, um, it's better to say that things are getting a bit tough. 
it's just it's become a feeling of you know I've bitten off a bit too much than I can chew this time and in saying that I've bitten it off and now I've got to chew it and swallow it because I'm not going to spit it out <laughs> it's getting really hard it's getting really hard in my character I tend to want to help um, want to help people a lot but part of that comes with an understanding that people will help me out when I need to and there's not a lot of that happening and it's just little things and probably because I'm a girl I overthink them but it's just that's what I'm going through at the moment moral of the story is keep talking time. keep talking keep venting cry you can cry but don't don't just don't just cry and sit there you gotta keep you gotta keep moving forward just like this ridiculous fucking trip we just gotta keep moving forward I think sometimes when um, she suggests some ideas I think she doesn't feel like her opinion is valued too much which is a it's a real shame I hope that it changes and I hope that she um, starts to feel a little bit better over the next um, few days and weeks and stuff um, because you know we still have a long time ahead of us and I would hate for her to um, have sour memories of this trip because this is a trip of a lifetime um, so yeah um, watch the space I'm sure I'll see what I can do. I definitely had my days throughout the trip where everything was still too much and still too painful and irritating. I think people are a lot more understanding and kind than you expect them to be. I think we all paint each other in bad lights sometimes or we all think we're all too busy in our own lives to care but you've just got to make that first little step. I think it was just a big release of trust. I just thought right these boys haven't led me astray so I'm just going to completely sit back. They've done plenty of travelling, they're not bad people, I'm just going to sit back, put my trust in them and let them steer us wherever this trip's going to go. Oh my god! Oh. 
looking out the front window now, the car looks naked. Yeah. <laughs> so this is not right. Oh, that's so gnarly. <laughs> oh, it's just like a soggy bag of paint. <laughs> Woody, where are we? Uh, Dubrovnik, old town. Uh, that's all I know so far. <laughs> it's pretty sweet though. I'm First impressions? Good. What's that? First impressions? Uh, yeah, well, we kind of got here and then it started pissing down. <laughs> Probably just been rocking the old beer feet actually. Yeah, don't want to jam or blow out. Yeah, and it is so slippery. <laughs> Other than that, cool old school buildings. So Chris was our friend that we met in Thailand and he was the one that originally conceived the idea of doing the Mongol rally. Ralph and I met him in Chiang Mai and he already knew about the rally at this point. So he suggested it to Ralph and Ralph had never heard about it. Ralph was instantly hooked on the idea and I think within 48 hours he had signed up and paid for the registration and was just looking for team members. Chris unfortunately couldn't do the rally that year because of work obligations. He works for Land Rover over in the UK. We're gonna go pick up Chris Yay, from the airport. Yay, so. 15 mate. <laughs> yeah. 30 degree heat. Five, five people and, and Molly. Chris had wanted to do the Mongol rally for a very, very long time. And he would have been on this team from start to finish if he was able to get enough time off from work but it just wasn't going to work out like that so we were looking at potentially at somewhere between like a week to two week period with Chris. We were hesitant to get him on board with Iran because just having him as a British national would have meant that we needed to have a guide with us from the government which would have increased the cost considerably. So it worked out that Ralph was having a birthday roughly when we were going to be in Croatia and Chris was keen to see some of the Balkan states again as well as revisit Turkey because he had been there before. So we decided that's what we would do. I have some delicious pizza. Pizza? Yeah. Is that coming up? Oh yeah. <laughs> before we celebrate Ralph's birthday. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> What time is it, Ralph? It's beer o'clock. Cheers to a lovely, quiet evening in Croatia. Cheers, Gun. Cheers, Happy birthday, mate. <laughs> oh, Chris. What do you think? Oh. <laughs> what have you just bought, Ralph? Uh, Jägermeister uh, and Cornel. Neck piece. That should happen. Yeah, that's permanent. Yeah. Hey, um, we're at a two head of Papa at about two in the morning in the middle of sleep and I guess we're all getting in trouble. Chris down the day, passed out. <laughs> Get some more done. Get a little bit of food. Ah. Ah. See how easy that went down. Beautiful. <laughs> He's dying on the inside. I'm, yeah. I'm fine. <laughs> that was a brilliant drink. I applaud Chris. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit. <laughs> How are we going this morning boys? Pretty good man. Yeah. Awesome. Beautiful. Yeah, what a spot eh?
Pretty bloody good. <laughs> yeah, so last night we finished up with a tattoo parlor about uh, three o'clock ish. Three o'clock, yeah. yeah. How are you guys' tats looking this morning? Ah, yeah. Good rundown. Pretty good. Nice and clean, so. Very nice. Happy. Cool. Cleaned it earlier. Like the goggles. Oh, look at the that. That's the kiwi. Beautiful. <laughs> Let's have a look. Oh, cool. A little bit red, but no, looking Dude. bloody good, man. Bam! Boom boom, oh, I'm better film it this way so we can read it. Mole. So classy. Mole. <laughs> All the love. All the love. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Close -ups. Now after a few days of rain, we're risking it and we're gonna reapply dog to the front of the car. Beyond here it's Turkey and Iran, so hopefully it'll be a bit warmer and drier. I want to have it a bit warmer. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not warm enough already. Nah. The return of dog. He's back. <laughs> the car was running like really well. And I distinctly remember us having several conversations being like, oh my God, we're going to get through this whole rally and not have a single breakdown. We were so wrong. So damn wrong. But I remember there being almost somewhat cockiness going around within the group that our car had been running so well and we were going to make it through this rally without any stress and it was all fine and dandy. The first few weeks of the rally, like when we were just driving through Europe and that, the car was purring the whole time. We didn't have any issues at all. Um, everyone was still pretty motivated and untied. This is the sharing facilities. How you going, buddy? Prior to entering uh, Turkey and the Middle East, didn't have too many expectations really. I was really focused on kind of keeping an open mindset for that part of the world because all I kind of had heard about it was through media, um, which nine times out of ten isn't the best stories. But I kind of knew, kind of knew I needed to keep an open mindset. I've always had on the back of my mind like the rally's kind of getting serious once we get into Turkey. It's kind of it's kind of like the gateway to the Middle Eastern kind of part of the world. So we've been driving all day and we've just kind of gone into Istanbul. Did you see it? No. Oh. He's a fucking centipede about this big in the car. He's <laughs> <We're> rolling around. <laughs> We've just noticed. Yeah. And Chris is going to get it for us, aren't you Chris? Get on you mate. <laughs> you know, I can't remember who looked down but they, they started freaking right out like there were limbs going everywhere. And so there's a centipede and I looked down and I kind of caught the tail end of this massive centipede. Like from what I've seen I probably would have seen like 200 mils of it. Disappearing into the under the seat. <laughs> what are you doing? Cross my biscuit. Make sure it's not in your biscuit. I, I don't think it is. Oh, it's in your biscuits, Megan. <laughs> We're about to try and extract Chrissy from the car. Got some kebabs to tempt him out. <laughs> Hopefully, some work. I don't know what will. <laughs> Resort to tearing the seats out. Mm. Fumigating And then if we, don't, if we don't find them by tearing the seats out, then I'm not driving. <laughs> <laughs> um, and once we'd kind of um, checked into our Airbnb, pulling the car apart and pulled the front seats out, 
um, pulled part of the carpet up, but we never found it. Um, so yeah, we kind of called it Bruce, and for the next couple of days, everyone was pretty on edge. Where are you, Bruce? Brucey, come out, yeah. come out and play. <laughs> Somewhere inside Molly, the beast lurks. So we haven't found the centipede. We're running the gauntlet. Chris is driving. We're praying to God. What do you think will happen if it makes an appearance in the next five minutes? I think we'll crush. <laughs> <laughs> We drove to Ankara and that's where Chris was flying out from. So we drove there, um, said our goodbyes to Chris. He wished us best of luck for the rest of our trip. <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> we've been the one looking at the mechanical side of things. Decided to leave the radiator cap off. Mm -hmm. Golden moment. <laughs> right on. We didn't stay in Ankara overnight, we kept on going to um, Cappadocia, which is on most of our bucket lists, um, mine for sure, because obviously it's got the hot air balloons and the amazing landscape around it with the old tunnels built into the hills. I'm filming this. Hi. I'm filming. <laughs> 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 so, today is about 35 degrees. We've been driving for about 450 k's. Um, and the canvas is getting a bit warm, so we're just giving it cool down time. Morning! <laughs> Alright Dylan, where are we heading? Um, it's called like um, Tall Gurs or something. Um, it's this massive salt lake just south of Ankara in Turkey. Um, so it kind of looks like the bottom of salt flats. Um, it's a few kilometers away to the entrance to the the lake, or what we think is the entrance, we just kind of found a road on a map that looks like it drives into a bit of a lake, so it makes sense for that to be it. Um, so we've turned down this road, and it looks like we've got another 66 kilometers of gravel and potholes and endless um, ground, which is pretty cool to be driving down. We haven't seen one of these roads yet, so here we are, we're, like I said, in Northern Turkey, trying to dodge the dust devils that are coming through. Um, and it's pretty cool. <laughs> Very nice. So here it is, folks. The endless desert storm. Central Turkey felt kind of a, not completely flat, but like kind of, you know, very much like a flat desert. And the further east we got, the emptier it felt. Then, as we started getting towards the eastern border it started getting quite mountainous we actually camped the night near mount ararat so we're somewhere in the desert and um yeah. we've stopped because i needed to stretch my legs so I'm driving for about 500 k's already we've come across this random little dirt bridge um it's pretty neat there's not a lot going on here no it's not too much living trees and dead trees Car, um, car over there. Most excitingly, found a donkey. But he looks kind of sad. Mm. Cool fella. Yeah. No one was really too sure what to um, expect in Iran. All you really hear is just what you hear on the media, and it's not always that great. The tensions with Iran continue to escalate this morning. Iran is really raising the stakes here. It's a very vast country, very empty. It's a lot of a lot of deserts, uh, dry, arid land. 
You have these highways that cut through it, but you look around and there's not really anything off the highway until you reach a town. So here we are on the side of a highway. Uh, we believe there is a seal or something busted inside the gearbox. And uh, we've just lost third gear, so we're thinking that it might be time to put some more in. Unfortunately, Nissan doesn't really exist in Iran, so we're just kind of going with the keep topping it up theory and hopefully it'll come right. Chuck it on, mate! It's got like an IV line. So, we have kind of worn out a gearbox seal. We're going to try and find a mechanic. He's definitely not going to have the right part, but we're just going to try and watch something. <laughs> <laughs> At no point did we feel like we were in danger in Iran. The Iranian regime is the leading state sponsor of terror. It exports dangerous missiles, fuels conflicts across In fact, the every time we stopped, we would draw crowds of people, regardless of whether or not we were able to communicate. Iran must end its threatening behavior against its neighbors, many of whom are U.S. allies. It felt like we were being treated like rock stars almost, just driving along the motorways and people were waving at us and passing through fruit and little gifts and stuff like that and everyone was tooting. Um, it was unreal, yeah. States like these and their terrorist allies constitute an axis of evil. To paint it with one sweeping brush stroke is completely wrong. We asked the Iranian people, is this what you want your country to be known for? For being a co-conspirator with Hezbollah, Hamas, the Taliban, and Al-Qaeda? Everyone was so happy to see us, to just see that there were foreigners coming to visit their country because they're not ignorant. They know the rest of the world thinks they're a bunch of terrorists. The United States of America will not permit the world's most dangerous regimes to threaten us with the world's most destructive weapons. To believe that everywhere in the Middle East is full of conflict and hatred and violence is completely ignorant. So guys, what's uh, what's happening? <laughs> um, well, we've been bombarded with friendliness <laughs> trip. A crazy amount. Um, and we've just been talking to visiting a family. <laughs> <laughs> on, the on the highway. They highway. seem like they've won the lottery. They're <laughs> coming to visit their house. <laughs> and they passed us melons through the window. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, so we've stopped again and now I've swapped places with one of the people and now I'm in the lovely car going to get some tea potentially and uh, this is the guy driving us and now we're in Hal 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 It was really cool, we just chilled out um, in the lounge with them and they said yeah we'll make you dinner and whatnot for a little while and then the um, daughters all took us out to show us around their local town and so we got to meet like, their friends and some cousins of them and um, I remember the youngest girl, she was trying to teach me some words, um, <laughs> which I'm terrible at by the way, <laughs> but she didn't get too frustrated at me, it was good, um, but yeah it was, such a, it was such a lovely, heartwarming just experience, it was so nice, the family, yeah they're the most welcoming people in the world. It's another amazing feast prepared for us by the family. Traditional Iranian food, kebab. So good! And look at this giant cake of rice. That <laughs> night we all uh, slept together in the lounge. They, they just put down these mattresses and we all just slept together on the floor. Um, you know, there was no, no division between us and there was no concern about these people from another culture, you know, sleeping right next to us or us to them, you know. We were all just people then. Um, they have treated us like royalty all night and we've been so privileged to stay with them. They were so upset that we had to go. They were begging for us to stay for another two or three days and we said, look, you know, we, we would love to but we can't just because we've only got five days in this country and we've still got, you know, 
three quarters of the way to to get to Mashhad, let alone to Turkmenistan. If the gearbox had of seized up or run out of oil, it probably would have been game over for us, just because of the type of car we're in and the part of world we were in. So once we um, got to the mechanics, we kind of showed it the problem and they, they kind of ummed and hard a bit because they kind of specialised in bigger Nissan vehicles like patrols. It was a father and his three sons were running it. They sent one of the guys out on a motorbike, he was looking for the part for about two hours. So they put it all in and they put it back together, topped up the oil, then we go to pay them and they, they refused to accept our payment <laughs> after five guys and pretty much a full day's work. Yeah, it was just, it was so friendly, it was ridiculous how, how much we were helped out there. Hopefully this is the last leak for today. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we got some travelling to do now. Yeah. We've got to get to the Tajik, uh, Turkmenistani border. So, we're cruising down the highway in Iran. We had a bit of a downpour last night. Once again, dog has suffered. And we're just driving along and we've seen bits of paper flying off. Yeah, we'll bring him yeah I think he's going to come back inside. We'll live out the rest of his days. Oh dog. Oh dog. Look at him. He's gone for the jugular. Yeah, he's got a bit of a Froden picture now at the moment. Yeah, yeah. He'll be back. Oh dog. What do we do, Ralph? Bring him inside. Yeah. Let him let him dry off again. Yeah. Back Poor to dog. it. <laughs> Guys, here we are in the beautiful Turkmenistan. We crossed. The dog is with us inside still, <laughs> looking great. Uh. Turkmenistan was a really strange country. Like we knew it was a dictatorship, and there wasn't a lot of people going in or out of it. Um, but we got there quite late because we were fixing the car all day, so. Ashgabat is the crown jewel of Turkmenistan. It is where their president lives and it is full of buildings that look like they're from the future and the past at the same time. You get there and there's all these big buildings but there's no one on the streets. You've got six lane highways and the only people on it are the, the like shampoo truck and the people following it scrubbing the road. We kept going that same day, aiming to get to the big gas crater. We thought it would be a fairly easy drive getting there because on the GPS it said it was pretty much a straight shot. Shortly after we got out of Ashgabat the road turned horrendous. Massive kind of car killing potholes. So it's about midnight and we're almost at the uh, Vatsa gas crater. Um, we've been stuck in the sand a few times, uh, thanks to me, and now the muffler has popped off as well as you might be able to hear. So we think we're about... Our little map just kept saying, oh, it's, you know, like 130 metres away, so but 130 metres never comes. We just keep driving and keep getting bogged and the exhaust keeps falling off. It fell off like 10 times before we decided to just rip it off and stash it in a bush and come back to it the next day. Once we got there we were so covered in dust and so exhausted but so excited and we felt so accomplished that we'd finally got there so we just kind of parked the car up, ran over to the crater and just hung out there for like half an hour even though it was yeah, almost 3 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. And got stuck once. Once. Right at the start. Not oh. once. Because <laughs> some bastards. Oh my god. But you know why? Some to see this. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh.
crank and we have retrieved the exhaust pipe. Still there, deal with that later. So we accomplished the gas crater last night, um, but the car's taking a little bit of damage. One of the main things is put the exhaust system back on. It's a good start. And um, she's revving her tits off at the moment. Um, and doesn't turn off when you want it to turn off, so. I think it's something to do with timing. The trip to the gas crater in Turkmenistan had really been the beginning of Molly starting to feel like she was suffering. I think going through all that sand and shitty roads was a turning point. Although we had fixed temporarily the gearbox issue in Iran, we started to get more issues with our vehicle once we got to Uzbekistan. Well, it's just happened. I oh, was just cruising along this bumpy ass road. Nicked the bump, thought I just knocked the exhaust pipe off, and it started going. Rah, 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 rah. Pulled over, and we just have a massive hole in our petrol tank, and it is this and out. Yeah, that's an gushing flight. We were losing gas really quickly, so we tried to poxy it up in the middle of the night. What are we using to plug the hole? Well, this is called a leak fix. Mm -hmm. And so far... It hasn't really done its job. But we have another sort of metal boxy. But it didn't really work so flash, so... It, it was enough to get to the city, but we ended up camping in the desert. And then the next morning, getting to Bukhara. What do you reckon, Ralph? Still leaking. <laughs> we spent one morning looking around some really amazing um, temples with all these awesome coloured tiles and stuff on them. Super beautiful. Just like you'd imagine in Aladdin or any of those kind of like Arabian night type movies and that was really awesome but it was just a country that we just needed to make up time and get through for the real the really hard roads that were still to come I don't think any of us knew what to expect from Tajikistan. We spent a whole day crossing over big mountain passes and down into deep valleys and what felt like we were heading into the middle of nowhere. Beautiful, beautiful landscape, but just felt like we were driving into the middle of nowhere. And then all of a sudden we came across this, what seemed like a thriving city, just absolutely in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, so I've got the dirty hands for the first time on this trip. Me helping out legal mechanicals actually was kind of just lifting tyres off the roof, but it's more than I've done the rest of the trip. So. And that was our big stop to stock up on everything, get the car in as good a working order as we could get it. And from there it was going to be about four to five days of the absolute unpredictable. So what is this supposed to do? Uh, I've kind of stopped it from bottoming out. Right. Yeah. So what we're going to do, we've got books and crack, US Open. Yeah. Crack Only system. the best for my way. Only the best. Duct tape them in. Special edition books and US Open suspension system. <laughs> um, feeling confident? Oh, confident as always. Put a duct tape in and we laugh. <laughs> yeah. Always confident. Wilson. Smile. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> oh my god. <laughs> I'm spinning like a pro. Okay. Not the first radio. The highlight going through Tajikistan for not only us but many other rally teams going through is the opportunity to travel over the Pama Highway. We're leaving for Pama Highway today. And with us we have Ludacris Racing from Tauranga and also a Belgian team. Yeah. Well their name is, but um, hopefully... Lovely people though. Yeah, yeah, and hopefully uh, we don't get caught up in too much trouble on the Pamas, but if we do, it's good to know that we have got some other teams with us. You know, uh, Actually, the first blowouts of the trip. Um, the car hasn't had any. And I've had three. <laughs> yeah, it just, the landscape was surreal. Just massive mountains and the most crazy coloured rocks as well. You'd have orange and red and burgundy mountains at 4,000 metres above sea level. It was like driving on Mars. What's going on? Well, we just died. Um, seeing that there's no fuel in the fuel filter. Now the Pama Highway is the world's second highest international highway and um, goes for hundreds of kilometres through very steep mountainous terrain. <laughs> so here we are at the top of the Pama Highway at um, how high? Four, four, eight, six. Four, eight, four, six. Four, six, five. Four, six, four, six, five. five, five. We're going to lock it in there. Of mountain passes, potentially only very, very small villages with no supplies or anything along the way. Plenty of cars don't make it through the Pama Highway. It was incredibly remote, there was no one else in sight. The majority of it is bordering Afghanistan. Here is a um, red card, which we actually all agreed on at the start of the trip, but no one's actually done it up until now. Um, so I decided to pull one. What we're going to do is get starkers, go for a swim in this lovely lake here. Lake Karakul. We're still very high up at the moment. They're probably at least 3,000 meters. 3,000 meters? Yeah. One thing that the boys helped to teach me as well, as much as they absolutely drove me up the wall, I think they really helped to install a more confident side in me where going into unfamiliar situations where people aren't speaking the language, you're in 50 million degrees heat, you haven't showered in eight days, and some strange man's trying to talk to you in a completely foreign language and you just take it on with confidence and you just know you're gonna come out the other side with a cool story to tell, not with injuries or being tied up in a boot. Morning. 
meanwhile in Kyrgyzstan. It's a rush hour on the way home from work. <laughs> I do like to drive with a little bit of pace and was hoping that we could just, you know, if, if I hit the bumps with speed, you don't notice them or feel them quite as bad as if you, you know, go over them slowly and really drive through each one. So I thought everything was going okay until I hit one in particular and we heard a big crack. So... We need to find a welder to see if we can stick that back together, otherwise we're not going to be getting much further. So we got out, had a look, and realised that I had snapped the weld for the rear torsion arm bracket. So, this is how we're going to limp back to town. Hopefully, making it all the way this time. Yeah, popping out tyre. No, keeping these tyres intact. One of the rear wheels was actually rubbing against the guard. So that means the suspension wasn't sitting where it needed to be. And that meant that we couldn't continue pretty much. Tell me what you're doing here, Ruff. <laughs> I'm using some currencies from all around the world in coin form to make up some spaces so our wheel will fit so we can limp to the mechanic. Which is about 20k down the road ish. Duct taping some pennies and euros. And I think it's as we're changing the tire, we get intercepted by a mechanic who um, just happened to be driving back to town because he had something on and decided to forget his plans and help us out. In the workshop, we're just checking Molly up now, and um, this will probably be the start of a repair day. So he takes us to his garage and luckily they have a welder. Um, they don't have, oh, there isn't a great amount of English communication going through, but we managed to um, communicate what needs to be done. Now that is the piece that is supposed to be attached. However, it's currently not. And that is why we're here to fix it. All the dust that comes out every time. How much is that? So Molly's currently not quite high enough for them to get in at, and they keep making threatening gestures to roll the car, um, which Ralph doesn't seem too happy about. And to stop it from completely rolling, we've got a nice pile of tyres here um, in case it goes over. But I mean, we've got a bit of wall here anyway to stop it, but. Um, I guess they were really nice. They had um, their whole family were living across the road, and while they were fixing the car, probably so that we would be de stressed and also out of their hair, they kind of palmed us off to the family members and all the wives and daughters and stuff cooked us up this massive lunch. How's the local bro? Mm. Mm. <laughs> Good, thank you. <laughs> Don't know what it's called, I've forgotten already. She had a tie. Maybe. White sand, white sand. <laughs> we'll go white sand. It's consistent. Then they salt. took us through a tour of um, their property and it was really nice. And then a couple of later, hours later, um, the car was fixed and on we went. She's nice. away laughing. Four of you in there, she'll be sitting mint. Look how high Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> Put my head in there nearly. Nearly. Okay, you good? Yeah. Got them in, they kind of fit. I make a bit of noise. Um, we'll see how today goes. But it's definitely better than sitting down there. Yeah. Mm, I agree. So these springs are like. But that's yeah. chunky ass. Oh, yeah, it super. doesn't fit. Yeah. Got <laughs> yes! Look at that! They do uh, eventually manage to weld it back on. Uh, however, they just kind of welded it to the place where we had stropped it to, which wasn't necessarily where the bracket originally sat. So from this point forward, the car was kind of crabbing, so it meant that we were 
burning through tyres than, uh, faster than what we had been prior to this. It's pretty flat out there, but uh, the roads are a bit lumpy. So I'm leaving it behind the wheels to so just prove that she did actually drive at some point. <laughs> and in the back seat, we have got, got Steve. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> We've got Matt from Ludicrous Racing. And um, that means that. Oh, jump ship. So this is the guy that just got me on a speed game. Even give me the ticket. Give me the ticket. It seems like every second person is employed as a traffic cop and they will try anything to give you a ticket or get a bribe out of you. So day two and we've now been pulled over for the third time in Kazakhstan. Woody has once again had another run in with the law. Again, always well, got the hood up. Pretty frequent occurrence these days. Yeah. I think, actually, if we hadn't been pulled over so many times, Kazakhstan somehow would have been even less exciting and eventful than what it already was. <laughs> So it is about 8 o'clock in the morning, we've just entered Russia after trying to cross the border at about midnight. We got through easily enough, it just took forever to get through customs on both the Kazakh side and um, the Russian side. Um, otherwise everything's going all good except for the fuel filter, it's once again playing up. So in the last 20 minutes, this is the third time we've pulled over and uh, I had to clean it out. Hopefully this is the last. Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan and into Russia and Mongolia, that's when the air became cooler, we'd see a lot more clouds hanging around sometimes, sometimes it would rain a little bit and that's when we started to realise that you know, on some of these remote places on the Mongolian steppe, we were now kind of at a, at a risk of encountering big storms or downpours or the kind of weather that for one could do a lot of damage to dog and two yeah would get us really really wet it's freezing there's some fresh snow up on the hills up there um, but, yeah. for the first time on the rally it really felt like we were there because there was you know 20 other rally cars around us and up until then we'd just seen the occasional one or two here and there apart from you know the, the couple that had been with us the whole time so it was a really cool opportunity to catch up with all these teams um, and see how they were going people were you know lining up the gas boilers and uh, making hot cups of coffee while we're waiting for the um, the checks to go through and yeah it was a really cool morning So the thing with our Russian visa was that it was a dual entry, but once we had entered for the first time, we had 30 days. The timer was ticking. I think right from the beginning, we always knew Mongolia would be 
one of the most challenging countries to cross just due to the terrain and lack of decent roads, even maps to go through the roads. So it was getting very real. Alright guys, where are we? Oh God! At some point you would just be following kind of a dirt track um, and other points there were these immaculate brand new highways uh, which seems so out of place in such a uh, remote mountainous location but also what was even more bizarre about them was that there was no one on them and quite often there would be these massive piles of dirt at the end of the road that would prevent you from getting onto it the roads are all built up so you can't drive up the side because it's just like a big ditch essentially. We were a bit nervous for driving the whole country because there's there's like a northern route and a southern route. These are the two, typically the two main ways that you would get across Mongolia. However, when we started the rally, there were these news reports coming out about these massive floods that had decimated the south of the countryside. There were some big storms that came through and killed thousands of people in southern Mongolia and washed out the southern route, which was typically the easier way to go. We didn't know at what point we were going to hit this area where the road was washed out and either have to take the northern route or take some back roads to get across to Ulaanbaatar. So we got halfway along and then we had been speaking to Peter the Russian who had who was a day ahead of us and he said that he um, hit terrible roads that were in no way worth crossing we decided to take a detour and take some back roads that would lead us up to the northern route and then finish our way across to Ulaanbaatar. We're lined up with our little convoy and uh, we got this road ahead of us. <laughs> and they're off! <laughs> the initial impression of Mongolia was that it was a lot drier and rocky than what I thought it was going to be. It almost felt like driving through some of the regions that we had been through in eastern Iran. Not quite as hot, but um, very much kind of, yeah, dry desert kind of environment. It was just, it was so barren and so natural. I always liken it to New Zealand, but without anything man-made in it. So just imagine, you know, big rolling hills and mountains, but not a single fence or house or proper sealed road in sight. And it was just valleys after valleys, after hills, after mountains of just pure nature. Each day was just driving hundreds of kilometres in vast open deserts, essentially. Apart from the occasional little village, there's just absolutely nothing. It's just big mountains and glaciers and dirt. And you, you wonder how it's possible for anyone at all to kind of scrape a living together will just survive, actually, in such an inhospitable environment. Gearbox oil is really leaking now, like, we topped it up like half an hour ago, full litre in there, and now it is just gone. I think anyone in their right practical mind would have said there's no way this car is going to make it through, you know, the roughest roads are yet to come. At the moment, we're using electrical tape yeah. to, um, and seal our gearbox up. Uh, 
<laughs> There's something about that car and that adventure that there was never any real doubt in my mind that we weren't going to make it to the finish line with that car. I think well over a hundred times we probably pulled over to either stick the exhaust back on or blow the gunk out of the fuel filter or try and figure out why there was steam blowing out of the bonnet. It was it just... We stopped counting. Molly and definitely Ralph had just done an outstanding job the whole time and there was no way I was ever going to think the idea of us not making it into existence. That detour section was the hardest, uh, the worst condition, but also the most memorable part of all of Mongolia. I'm glad that we went through there despite all of the chaos it caused us. The night when we were rushing to find a campsite and we saw those giant black clouds rolling over the hills, there was definitely an instant sort of urgency about us. It was like, right, we really need to find somewhere. <laughs> so, our convoy has just arrived here in the mountains. We're just about to set up camp and maybe make this a bonfire. And you can't see, but it's fucking snowing. I don't think it's snowed in the mountain. <laughs> here we are. I want the 40 degrees. Yeah, we were 40 degrees two weeks ago. <laughs> so, camped up for the night. As we may have mentioned earlier, it's snowing <laughs> on our tents, cars. Molly's currently getting a bit going on her. This is Woody's tent, and we're all just gonna pile up in here tonight because we need to save body warmth to make it through. But in the meantime, we do have a little campfire going on over here. Yes, we do. Nugget Micra and uh, the Slick Pigs were collecting some wood on the way here. We thought we were going to have a great bonfire. Um, we will hang out in front of, but um, unfortunately the snow has kind of uh, put a spanner in the works for that. But um, no, it's actually kind of nice still in front of it, but part of me does want to be in the tent. <laughs> Hi right, guys! Hey! Good night! <laughs> so, how we going? What's happening outside, Dylan? <laughs> yeah. It's snowing. <laughs> ah! Oh, <no. laughs> I've got arms around everyone. So, we've all yeah. migrated to the Woody's together. tent. Yeah. Thanks, Papa Woody. No worries. no worries. It was not designed to be a four person tent. The only way that we could make sure that we all fit without putting too much pressure on the sides and compromising the fly was to make sure that we were kind of in a spoon train and that we were all facing the same direction because if we all were on our backs there was just not enough space so it meant that at multiple stages throughout the night if we wanted to roll over because we were uncomfortable everyone had to roll over but that was fine it was actually really warm in that tent that night uh, three or four days to go, and uh, this is definitely a new experience on the rally. <laughs> you know, you so um, we'll we know how we go in the morning. Hopefully, we'll be in a still foot. Oh, yeah, and it's yeah, still alive, and in a, in a foot of snow. I can love a foot of snow. That'd be pretty fucking gold. Yeah, yeah. mind you, it'll be pretty hard to get out. Molly's already covered. Yeah. And so we woke up the next morning and for the first 10 minutes, it's great. It's so exciting. Good morning from the Mongol convoy and the slick pegs. Look at all the snow people. <laughs> Yo, it's like, oh yeah, we got Uncle Steve here. <laughs> I was just like, oh shit, not good. <laughs> it's pretty cold. We've got like half a foot of snow. There was no here. snow here last night. <laughs> it doesn't even snow this good in New Zealand. But there's all cars. 
but then we have to start packing up and <laughs> your hands quickly freeze um, when you're dealing with snow not with the proper equipment and trying to pack up a tent and also brush all the snow off it's so cold I think we were all just so excited about all this snow that none of us were really taking the time to comprehend what it might mean if we were to break down or have any more troubles or if the next giant big purple cloud heading towards us was going to leave us stranded somewhere. Getting out of the campsite was definitely enough of a mission in itself just to get the cars out without being stuck. Molly got out like a breeze but a couple of the other teams were stuck up the top by the campsite for a short while until they made it down onto the road. So the road looks like it's okay, there must have been a few trucks that have gone over it already this morning. We headed that way into that deep dark shit over there. We're driving along and we're not really being hit by any snowfall but we come across a river and we can see in the distance there's been one or two uh, freight trucks that have come through but this felt like one of the bigger and I guess wider rivers that we had to go through so far and so we decided to take it one at a time. Ludicrous Racing go through first and they're fine, they're in the Vauxhall and the Vauxhall to this point has been uh, pretty much a, a dream to drive. So they get to the other side and um, Molly's up next. Within seconds, we see water is starting to flood through the car, through the holes in the floor, through the doors. All the other teams around us are just looking on in horror. Ludicrous Racing managed to quickly pull out a rope. We're kind of climbing out the windows and standing up on top of the car and on the bonnet, just trying to stay dry while we kind of watch our belongings and food float out the window. I was just like, bugger it, there's no point sitting here doing nothing or standing on the roof doing nothing. So I just got out, walked through the river. It's the coldest thing I've ever been in. It's just a big shock that goes through you. It feels like all your wind's taken out of your breath. It feels like your heart's literally just stopped beating because it's too cold. They were originally going to try and tie it onto the roof, but I know for a fact that if you try and tow a car from the top of its roof, it's only going to pull it down. So I grabbed the tow rope, I took off some of my layering, but didn't want to take it all off because it was way too cold to walk in there half naked. All I could, all was going through my head was, oh my gosh, I don't want to put, you know, my head under. I don't want to have to put my head under. But somehow, just straight away, I just could feel the, feel the little latch where the tow hook had to go on, and just hooked it straight on, and just got straight out of the river as fast as I could. Megan kind of starts to get into hypothermic shock so we quickly wrap her up and put her in another car in dry clothes and just crank the heaters so she can try and warm up again. Everything was wet, everything just washed out in a flood of water and mud. And that was the, the, one, the one moment on the rally that I really had to walk away for a moment and just take a deep breath and think about how we were going to make it through.
so that day was difficult it was unexpected it was cold it was exciting it was some of the most difficult challenges that we faced on the entire rally yet those were some of the best memories looking back at it Luckily, Ralph kind of knew what was going on engine-wise and was able to get the water out of wherever it was. And within half an hour, the engine was going again. So that was promising. We weren't completely stuck in the middle of a blizzard with a dead car. However, we were there with an extremely wet car. So slightly defeated, um, but carrying on. What was really ironic was that um, within another 10 k's, the new highway started again. <laughs> so we're on our last half an hour in Mongolia. It's been uh, one hell of a trip. Good to rest up after a long few days camping. What, we got up to eight days without a shower, I think. The water was feral. <laughs> definitely bittersweet. I'm tired but it's but it'll be such an achievement to see this beautiful little red beast make it to that finish line with lots of champagne and yeah. For a couple days now we had all just been dreaming about getting to a big city and being able to buy some KFC because it just felt like a reward <laughs> for, for making it through this horrendous landscape. Despite everything we had been through and the condition of the car, I think that was what we were most looking forward to, is just making it to the finish line, uh, the official finish line, and um, celebrating with all the other rallies. Exhausted. Off. <laughs> yeah. Lovely. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>
worried that he's going to be eaten alive by Tex. Tex! So we're going to leave him here. Brain damage. Bye bye. <laughs> We got back from lunch to find out for the second time that peaches and cream put honey all over our door handles. Thumbs up. Onwards to Uzbekistan. Oh, that's right. Oh my god! He's got no space!